be back with my reference peeps after so many years. Um, I, uh, that's a great picture of me. I wear bow ties now. Bow ties are cool. Thank you. Uh, three people got that quote. All right. Um, I rarely do this, but I am going to actually read remarks. Oh, good Lord. Uh, because words matter. In fact, that's a lot of what I talk about. What we call things, what words we use, how we describe things matter. They have power. They connect us and they disconnect us in different ways. And it's, the concepts I want to talk about today are important. And so I hope you will excuse me from um, that. Now, for the good news is that while I'm over here, you can completely ignore me. And I'll put pretty pictures over there. So it will work out well. Every year, the University of South Carolina School of Library and Information Science have a hooding ceremony for graduating librarians in the Rutledge Chapel on the historic horseshoe of the campus. The chapel is in Rutledge College, the first building built for the South Carolina College, now the University of South Carolina, in 1805. It was built in part with slave labor. Before the Civil War, before the Civil War students and faculty brought their slaves to college. During the war, the building served as a hospital for wounded Confederate soldiers. It is remarkable then that after the war, during the period of Reconstruction, Rutledge was opened as the state normal school that prepared African American women to be teachers. Faculties of all genders, colors, lectured in these halls. There we go. If I were to end the story there, it would be one of redemption and pride. However, it doesn't end there. After Northern troops withdrew from the college and Columbia, the newly elected white male governor closed the school, dismissed the integrated board of trustees, and reopened the university a year later in 1880 as an all-white, all-male institution. Huh. It would be 83 years before the university accepted another African-American student in 1963, the same year as Martin Luther King Jr.'s March on Birmingham and Washington. I tell this history to graduating librarians for the same reason I tell you. In a profession that professes diversity and empowerment to all through knowledge, we can never take social progress for granted. Progress in what we know and who we include in that knowledge and even the definition of what constitutes knowledge requires the continuous, dedicated work of an engaged citizenry. In our neighborhoods, in our academies, our halls of government, our industry, and our communities of faith, there is needed advocates for an improved society. Today, I will make that case that you, as librarians first, but particularly as reference librarians, must be among those advocates and must advocate for everyone in the community, regardless of race, religion, education level, or country of origin. This is a job that cannot be delayed until tomorrow. We need to be community advocates, not because that is some future strategy or a direct response to falling reference questions. It is a duty outlined in the values of our profession and enabled by technology. Before I go into the hows and whys, let me be clear. This is not about resistance or an ideological reaction to the last national election. We can certainly have that conversation too. Not in the comments. I'm not asking you to mobilize as liberals or conservatives, Democrats or Republicans. However, what I am asking you to be is political because it is about power and participation in a democratic, democratic society, and often power and participation in, those, in the service of those that have none. You cannot empower a person or community if you have no power to give. Oftentimes, I will ask people, if you would raise your hands if you feel that you're in the power business. Raise your hands if you feel you're in the empowerment business. You realize the root of empowerment is power, right? I just want to take that moment. You can't give something that you don't have. You can't teach someone to read unless you know how to read. 
And reading is by God a power, and one that I believe should be afforded across all of our communities. Now I've got to find out where I left that one. <laughs> Literacy, for example, is a necessary skill to be a full member of today's society. Reading and writing are the power to embrace and add to the cultural discourse. Reading is power. And if we seek to empower others, it is a power we must first possess. You must be able to read to teach others to do so. Likewise, to empower, other, empower others in information literacy or research or career seeking, we must first have that power ourselves. The dispensation of power granted by taxpayers, trustees, partners, or superintendents is a political process. If you think that inspiring the love of reading, providing access to the latest research in a discipline, maintaining an open community space, or providing instruction are somehow neutral or objective aims, then you don't understand why a white male governor closed my university to former slaves in the 1800s. There is great truth to the saying that knowledge is power, and the goal of librarians is to facilitate a more knowledgeable community, a more powerful community. This mission, building a more knowledgeable community, can be traced back to the origins of libraries millennia ago. However, these roots are even more obvious when we look at the emergence of libraries in the United States. Public libraries as we know them today grew out of a social movement, the same social movement that took children out of factories and created public schools. I would take a moment for that. It was a social movement when people said that our children should not be exploited in factories that created the concept of childhood that we have today. There was nothing inherent that said before you're 18, you live a special charmed life. It was because people got together and said, this is what we believe, and enacted in law and built infrastructure and protested and made it happen that we created that separate space. Public libraries, as we knew of them, grabbed the social movements. It was Melville Dewey that said that a public library is a co-equal educational institution to the public school. Carnegie funded libraries to support a population that sought to govern itself. Of course, how librarians achieve this more knowledgeable community is up for debate. Over the past century, we have seen the why, or sorry, seen the way in which librarians sought to support our society shift dramatically. In academic libraries, we have seen librarians as professors of the humanities give way to a core of library professionals with ever-escalating academic preparation. In the public libraries, we saw a focus on limited collections to the embrace of fiction, media, and today the advent of learning spaces with a focus on makers. One of my favorite books is Wayne Wiggins' Part of Our Lives. In it, he quotes a California newspaper editorial railing against a new type of item being collected by the public library, saying that it would only interest, quote, school children, factory and shop girls, men who tended bar, drove carriages, and worked on farms and boats. And finally, and this is my favorite, Fallen women, and in general the denizens of the midnight world, night owls, prowlers, and those who live upon sin and its wages. Good lord, that was wonderful. That item type, what was being collected, what was this person railing against? The literary novel. I swear to God, this person was saying, Jane Eyre is the pornography of our era. We must stamp it out. Today, it is common knowledge that novels and fiction are at the core of inspiring reading in our libraries. However, that is only because of the conscious, coordinated, and sustained efforts of librarians seeking to improve their communities. Further, this sustained effort is guided by a set of explicit principles. What we take for granted as common sense today and common practice is because people stood forward and made a decision and guided communities to change. And we need that now more than ever. Today, I argue 
that continuing this mission, the improvement of society through facilitating knowledge creation, or more simply, learning, within our communities requires a different tact. Reference librarians must now fully embrace a mission of learning. We must understand that a reference interview is not simply a question and answer transaction, but a highly customized and compressed instructional session. The programs we offer, the collections we build, the lib guides we write, and the consultations we do are all learning activities. The focus of learning is hardly new. In 1939, at the end of the Great Depression and in the face of Jim Crow segregation, ALA put forth a code of ethics in which the author stated, quote, librarians should recognize librarianship as an educational profession and realize that the growing effectiveness of their service is dependent upon their own development. In other words, to be a librarian is not only to help others learn, but to constantly learn, to model for the behavior of a community to say, if we want you to improve through learning, we too will improve through learning on a regular basis. Not hidden away in a webinar and hidden behind a door, but right out in the middle of the open saying, I have no idea but I can't wait to find out. Soon, see, I lose my place, I'm sorry, it happens. For too long, librarians have seen their work as merely access to information. Access to information without explicit mechanism of instruction and learning is at best a slogan and at worst a dereliction of duty. Let me be clear, this applies to all of librarianship, not just instructional librarians or community outreach librarians, but all librarians. If you catalog a book, that's an instructional activity. If you answer a reference question, that is an instructional activity. Check out an item, sit in a chamber of commerce meetings, story time, research support, building maintenance, manage volunteers, metadata schema development, operate an institutional repository, edit an open access journal, publish a paper, conduct a survey. These are all instructional activities that can only be assessed against a single criterion. Did the community, the whole community, get smarter? Buttons. There are some serious consequences of putting learning at the center of what we do. These consequences are probably most evident, however, in how we conduct and conceptualize reference work. I will tackle three of these. Learning is participatory. Learning happens everywhere. Learning occurs in a social context. Learning is participatory. If there's one thing that separates the history of librarianship from formal education, it is the understanding that people learn, they are not taught. Formal education at the primary, secondary, and post-secondary levels were, and in some cases still are, set up around the idea that we teach people. The instructional model of education that places 30 students in a classroom or hundreds in a lecture hall, <coughs> sorry, just noticing something, presupposes that if we craft the delivery material just right, we can educate. If the professor can just give a compelling enough lecture or a teacher can sequence the material just so, bada bing, students learn. In libraries, however, we have been mostly set up to serve the engaged learner. We assume that motivation is driving a person to learn and so we wait at desks or in a building or at the end of a chat window for people to ask us questions or seek materials. What we now know in education and learning sciences is that both of these approaches are incomplete. People are neither empty buckets waiting for an instructor to toss in bricks of knowledge, and we know that some people's buckets are a little bit more narrow than other people's buckets. <laughs> nor are they disembodied questions in search of the answer. What we know is that people are not taught, they learn. What's more, they learn through engaged dialogue. Call it critical thinking or metacognition or simply conversation. People learn by interactions over time with experts, resources, and always with themselves. They take in information, 
relate it to what they already know, and if it fits their worldview, they expand or correct what they know. This means that lecturing at someone for an hour <clears throat> is as useless as throwing 30 documents at them in terms of all learning if neither the lecturer or the librarian first take account and accommodate an ongoing internal dialogue. Take, for example, studies that show when a person holds an incorrect understanding of a topic, showing them correct information not only doesn't change their minds, it actually causes that person to more deeply believe the incorrect situation. Or put another way, saying that 99% of scientists support the idea of man-made climate change not only isn't persuasive to climate change deniers, it could actually lead them to strengthen their doubt. What does make a difference is scaffolding new ideas and even contradictory ideas upon what a person already holds to be true. If education in education, this is often referred to as constructivism. People construct their knowledge. This means that simply informing someone is not going to achieve our mission of a smarter community. We must engage them in a dialogue. We must test what they currently believe and then build to a new view of the world, which we'll come back to in a moment. Issues of trust, language, and bias always play a role in how we serve anyone. As reference librarians, we must become experts in relationships, not transactions. We must seek out trust and sustain conversation, not the objective answer generators. Stop telling the world that you are the best search engine. You are not. You can't search a trillion items, figure out which one generates the most revenue, and throws three million results at someone in milliseconds. You can't do it. You shouldn't even try. You want to be the trusted source. You want to be the one that helps them understand. You want to be the person that understands that knowledge and learning is not about finding the right stuff. It is often about filtering out the wrong stuff. And the right and the wrong begins with a knowledge of the individual and the person, not of the materials and the database and the search string. One of the best examples of this today comes from my favorite superhero reference librarian, Nicolette. I'm going to screw up her last name, so I'm going to ask her to shout it out. Sazalski. Sazalski, thank you. Her recent work on supporting grieving patrons shows not only excellence in searching, but empathy for people in crisis. Put simply, it matters if people are grieving, or are hungry, or are scared. If we want people to learn, we must first see them as people living a complex life, and that only happens over time. We must also acknowledge that different members of our community are neither afforded the same opportunities for advancement, nor is it the best course of action forcing our ideals upon them. Learning happens everywhere. Just as the people who seek out help are ultimately in control of their learning, so too do they seek to be in control of the environment where they learn. On the surface, this seems both intuitive and a simple call for leaving our buildings. Yes, we must increasingly leave, leave the buildings. Leave, we must leave our buildings and do our work in classrooms, boardrooms, laboratories, and town halls. However, that's not my focus here. Now you're really scared of what's coming next. My focus here is the reason why we need to leave our buildings. The answer is because increasingly, the learning spaces of today are, today are virtual, provided by commercial interests and prone to be bubbles of groupthink. Yes, this is the Facebook problem. However, it is also the problem we see with the systematic dismantling of the public square due to pressures of development and concerns about security. Be afraid, be very afraid, sell things. 
This is also about our K-12 schools where students play footballs in state, play football in stadiums sponsored by soda vendors and listen to commercials on the bus ride home. Realize that in South Carolina, we're a rural state. In South Carolina, the state is mandating that students take online testing and do online homework with open access texts. That sounds great until you realize that how rural our county is. Some of these schools cannot take increased bandwidth within it because, frankly, they'd add a server underneath the hole in the roof where the rain comes in. What they are talking about doing, some of these districts, is they are going to Wi-Fi equip the school buses because these kids can be on the buses for hours a day. So that becomes their mobile classroom, and that mobile classroom with a great pizza ad on the side. This is a push in higher education to mine and sell data of students to lower tuition costs. This is the data acquired by software vendors from library provided ebooks and databases. To be clear, I am not, as some of my colleagues do, calling for a complete abandonment of private public partnerships. Rather, it is a call for librarians, and in particular reference librarians, to be in these spaces and to both be aware and make those we serve aware of the influence of these partnerships. We are not objective or unbiased, but we damn well better be observant and vocal. Learning occurs in a social context. As we learn, we adjust our worldview, how we see and relate to the world. In many ways, that view is very particular to ourselves. It is a strong part of our personality. However, that worldview is constantly being tested as it rubs up against reality, and more importantly, each other. In this way, how we see the world is strongly influenced by those around us. Our worldview is social. It is these two factors, the worldviews are individuals, but constantly shaped by the many, that speaks to our respect for diversity. The more diverse the environment in which we learn, the richer our worldview. It is the exact same reason we promote intellectual freedom. The more diverse the sources of learning, the richer the learning. This is important because it means to facilitate knowledge is not just about how one person learns, but how that learning fits into a larger social context and a larger social justice, I would add. So, just as librarians help weave together understandings of the one, we must also weave together the understandings of the whole, the community. To do this, we must actively reach out to those in our buildings and well beyond. To embrace and promote diversity in learning, we must constantly encounter diverse views and individuals within our communities. That includes those that we agree with and those that we don't. Those with power and those without. Those with privilege and even more importantly, those without. The purpose of this outreach is a smarter community and smarter is ultimately a benchmark determined in close and intentional consultation with the community itself. This is why the answer to fake news and filter bubbles is not simply more information literacy instruction. What is broken in our communities is not a sophistication of information consumption, but a lack of common meanings and values. This is not as simple as a belief versus science or liberalism versus nativism. This is about communities holding common understandings or values, and that means how to handle disagreements in these values. We will not have a more civil discourse until we act as more as one civilization, not as camps. You can't teach a class on common values. You can't build a webinar to tell people common principles. You can only bring together parties, provide a fair and equitable table, and argue to the truth no matter how uncomfortable that truth is. Reference librarians are not bringers of truth or teachers of information literacy. They are referees in the most consequential conversation of our time. What does it mean to be a community? To be clear, librarians are not neutral or passive players in these conversations. 
We want this to be an informed dialogue where the parties can refer to common evidence and documents. We are not passively waiting at desks for the parties to come together. We reach out and we go to the places these conversations are already occurring. Why us? Who appointed librarians to facilitate this conversation? The short answer is the communities that we serve. For some libraries, this is a charter issued by the state. For others, it is a place on the org chart. For academic libraries, it might be the requirements of an accrediting agencies. For school libraries, it may be, it should be, encoded into education law. In all cases, librarians have been given power by their communities to help inform and educate. A library is not, nor has it ever been, simply a collection or a building. It has been a mandate of the people, stewarded by librarians and dedicated to learning. In the public sphere, we are seeing a retreat of public service. Town Hall is increasingly seen as a battleground of ideology, and the safety net is framed. Teachers are locked into testing schemes, social workers overburdened. It is up to librarians to use our tools and skills to reach out and seek common ground. We are connected to our communities and we know our neighbors. We must be a missionary force going into the town and seeking out diversity and knitting it into a new community fabric for all. In our universities, we see the compelling pulls of teaching, research, and service. We see our disciplines grow more specialized as our problems grow inter more interdisciplinary. We are the intellectual professionals who must undergrid our academies, not just with resources, but connections, reflection, and instruction. In our schools, many libraries are the last refuge for the curious mind. School librarians provide the ever important area of reflection personal inquiry, and intellectual diversity. We must be the glue that binds the curriculum. In our governments, in our business, and our vendors, reference librarians must stop trying to emulate some sort of search engine and seek knowledge over data and hits. People are not algorithms. The current data-centric view of industry and decision makers will not free people, it will transform them into data points, shoveling data into the modern day equivalent of steam engines. The I see we have haters of steam engines in the room. <laughs> One of the visions that we hear who often, pardon me as I take a moment, is the idea that data will tell us. If we only have greater data, if we only collect more information, if we only gather it from their devices, if we gather it from their phones, if we gather it from all these places, we can make better decisions, we can replicate reality. We can process it better. But what we have learned is that data is not objective or independent or reality. It is guided by people who have their own motivations, and those motivations change what we collect, how we understand it, how we see it. Every day, data is collected, and we pretend it's objective so that we can divorce ourselves from the consequence of algorithms that deny people credit, deny them health care, deny them housing, because that's what the algorithms say. No, these are people. We are people, and our job is not to inform or to gather or to compress. Our job is to enlighten and inspire and open up possibilities that have nothing to do with what we can count. This is not the talk of a Luddite or a technophobe. I'm really not talking about getting rid of Google. Librarians embrace the new and the modern. Technology liberates us from the burdens of repetition, but that liberty should not come at the cost of privacy, diversity, and whimsy. In 1963, Henry D. Monley, Robert Anderson, and James Solomon became the first African-American students to enroll in the University of South Carolina in the 20th century. In 1965, Monteith became the first African-American graduate earning the BS in biochemistry. Just take a little quick moment. How many people when saw the three people thought that the first person to get the science degree out of this would be her? 
They did this because society looked at segregation and Jim Crow laws and decided that diversity and integration were essential parts of society and education. This was not a universal conclusion. And many sacrificed their lives and liberty to bring about this change. Nor did racism and segregation end in 1963. It is a wrenching conversation and wound and reality that impacts African Americans, immigrants, and refugees to this very day. It is a conversation that will not simply go away if not confronted, as we saw in the brutal killings at Charleston AME Church. It is a conversation with other conversations on LGBTQ rights, religious freedom, access to educational opportunities, a shifting workforce, growing wealth disparities, the role of government in our lives, and that are too important to be left unattended. These are conversations that will not be settled in Washington. They will not be settled in some foreign area. They will be settled on street corners, boardrooms, and classrooms of our communities across the nation. They are conversations that are dangerous and high stakes. However, a library should be a safe place to explore dangerous ideas. Yet they will not be safe places if we, librarians, work, unless we as librarians work to make them such. Nothing in the name library or laws or charters or organizational charts makes a library safe. Nothing created libraries as safe places. Nothing tells all people they are welcome on its own. How we organize the books what we show, what we display, how we greet people, when we put furniture in front of them, when we stand on high areas. We determine the level of interaction. The building is, does not make something safe. The security does not make it safe. The books do not make it safe. That's our job. And we need to get to work. Thank you very much. <laughs>